I am recording right now. Here we go. Coming down, and you're looking at me. <laughs> Here we go. Coming down in three, two, and one. Gordon, it is great seeing you, and thank you so much for the invite into your home. We were just saying, it seems like every time we see each other, it's at the Sheridan Center. But there's a reason why you're always at the Sheridan Center. That's right. There was an event going on down there for, uh, it was, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the event. But was, it was, was it the SoCan Awards I was trying to remember? Yeah, probably the SoCan Awards. SoCan Awards. Yeah. yeah. And, but you also could pass through there because you're a gym rat. You like to work out too. And usually when I see you sometimes, you're either going or coming from a workout. Well, I don't really like going to the gym that much, but I go. <laughs> I, go, I, go I, I don't love it. Uh, but I, I found that it was working a, a long time ago. I've been uh, had a, a, a program for, since about 1982. So uh, I keep that up and uh, it keeps me uh, working well and keeps me functioning. So I do it a lot. So that's why you see me running through there so often because I'm usually there about five or six times a week. And, uh, and at the same time, I look after things downtown. My office is downtown. Uh, I drive in from North York, and it's, it's all part of the job. And the job is, I mean, you are still touring. Yeah. You, b bottom line is, you love your job. Or do we even call it a job? I, uh, to, to me, it's, uh, staying prepared is, is what's the most fun, is, is, is being prepared for the, the, the next trip. And uh, all of my people, or the people who work with me, are of the one mind that they all want to keep on, you know, keep on doing what we're doing. And they're enthusiastic about it. And, and unless, like I say, there's some kind of a, of a reason why we can't work, but well, we're going to just keep on doing it. Well, part of that enthusiasm is this documentary that we're about to talk about. I don't think I've ever seen um, you doing a documentary like this, and uh, do you even like doing these kind of things? Because for folks who are going to get a chance to see this, I mean, it's a beautiful documentary. It really does go in depth into your into your story, into your music and stuff. But when you're approached with this, especially this style, I mean, what were your thoughts? Well, okay, I've done some work with the, with Insight in the past, uh, Insight Productions, uh, John Brunton and his people, and. Uh, uh, Joan Tassoni and uh, uh, Martha Kehoe, those, those three people were key, uh, asked me to do this, but suggested that I do one about 10 years ago, but we really didn't get around to it until five years ago. So, so this has been a five-year project? Yeah, it took about five years from the time we, we started doing it, but, but it's been, they've been thinking about doing it for five years before that. So it's it just like, well, okay, we're all still here. We're all still, nobody's getting any younger. Let's do it. I thought we might do it one day, and, we, and so it got done. How did you fit this in and still touring because you tour a lot? Well, I'm only on the road about 105 days a year, so that leaves what, whatever's left over. That's still a lot of days. <laughs> yeah, you got, you got to fit stuff in. And we run the business, too, and I, I don't uh, do, do the physical routine either when I'm on the road, so... Uh, like I just do that when I'm here in town, and uh, the, 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 uh, the, the physical routine really is what keeps my engine running. I know it sounds boring as heck, and it is. I don't particularly enjoy doing it, but I'm with a real good club and, and uh, uh, good people there, and uh, I've been working out for a long time. Because if I'm gonna be a professional, I'd like to look like one, and I'd like to, to feel like one. And it's just that simple. You definitely are, my friend. I don't want to give too much away to fans on this because I really think they need to see this and be surprised with what they get a chance to see. But, of course, we are talking about your music. We are talking about your legacy, yeah. though. Um, and one of the things I really enjoyed about it was we do get an in-depth on how you constructed your music, your songs, the environment that you felt you needed to be into. I thought that was very interesting. Um, was it always something that sort of was 
just sort of came together. And when I say that again, I want to give too much away, but for you, a table, a chair, a guitar, and anything can happen. Yeah, my first uh, song was written in grade 12, uh, sitting at, uh, at home in Aurelia, you know, at the, at the, at the kitchen table. And, uh, but I, uh, the, the only training I had in notation was uh, what I had learned by singing with the barbershoppers and from the few piano lessons that I'd had. So uh, I, I, I actually took a, took a musical course in notation, which gave me the ability to write my own lead sheets and do all that kind of stuff because uh, in those days you couldn't just have a CD. You had to have, like, have it written out on a lead sheet, you know, lyrics. Uh, chord symbols and melody. It had to be. You had to contribute. Send that off to the Library of Congress, and, and I didn't know how to do that, and so I had to learn how to do that. And uh, uh, from then on, I, I, I sort of kept writing stuff, and and pretty soon I had like like a, a bit of a uh, what you would call like a several songs, and uh, started. Uh, uh, driving down to Toronto and, and, and playing them for the people at BMI Canada, which was the Performance Rights Society uh, here in Toronto at the time, and they encouraged me to continue. And uh, I kept writing tunes, and pretty soon I got a chance to record. And, you know, one thing led to another. Now, now tw 20 original albums later, <laughs> I'm getting ready to make now number 21. You know, and, and uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm looking forward to doing that too. Uh, the, I haven't seen the documentary, and that's why I don't want to give too much away. I, I know, and, and I uh, and I want to be there with the people who are, the other people who are seeing it for the first time. Mm -hmm. You know, and but there are certain things I know we can talk about. For example, um, your days in Yorkville. I found it interesting. Um, you know, we've known about this kind of stuff, and some of the greatest artists on the planet were at that time all in Yorkville. Um, what was it like for you, not just back then, but to return and to see what Yorkville has become now? If we recently did uh, uh, take a stroll through Yorkville. We did some uh, some shooting down there for the documentary. Uh, it's changed a lot uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, apartments have been built and things like that. Building apartment buildings, uh, condos. Uh, other than that, the street itself looks pretty much. There's a few changes along the street. Uh, it, it, it kind of it, it feels a little bit different. I mean, that was a long time ago uh, that we were working there. Uh, when I was working there, I, I spent all my time working on my instruments between shows. So like I didn't like like get out between shows and and do very much hanging out. I was uh, I was more interested in doing doing really good shows and making sure that I was uh, always prepared for for the next upcoming show. And sometimes I would do three shows in, in a night there uh, at the Riverboat. And before that, there was there was a couple of other clubs too. There was the the Purple Onion where I you know I I had to to ask to to, to get in there. I had to to motivate them to hire me. I, I was at that point in my career where I was just uh, hovering on the verge of getting somewhere. And, I, I, uh, and, be, and before that, it was the Village Corner, where at the time I had a singing partner. And we actually made an album in, in the Village Corner, which was, <laughs> was very, very popular. It was quite funny, actually. Uh, to, 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 to get down there uh, recently as we did, it, it was, you know, it, it still felt good. You, you know, you'd, you'd like to say, oh, well, maybe it's gone sterile or maybe it's, gone, it's not exciting anymore. But I, I picked up the same vibes uh, uh, down there this time. And we, we did some shooting down there, too. And I got my, my head into it and started remembering, you know, what it was like uh, going over to the chess club, 71 Yorkville, you know, and Malka and Yoso and, and Neil Young and Joni Mitchell and all the other people. Everybody played the, at, at Bernie's played the riverboat. Everybody that you could possibly think of uh, went through the riverboat. But here's the amazing thing, though, too. You've had some of the greatest artists re-sing your songs. When did you finally start to feel that you were a 
songwriter. Was there a certain song or a certain point in your life? Because you had to work for it. And at a certain point in time, um, it was like, okay, I want to write great songs, but I also need to make a living too. When was there a point when you were like, it's not about just making a living. I am a songwriter and I want to put out great songs. I had to do it uh, uh, to, to think that way. Let me think about that. You see, like, finally, I was under contract. I had a recording contract. And it's surprising uh, sometimes when you're, uh, you're under contract like that, you tend to produce more. And that was what, it, what was happening to me. I knew I was under contract. At that time, it was United Artists uh, for six albums. And so I, I, I better start writing. Uh, one, one morning when I, I got out of, out of bed, I was still living in a, in a basement apartment and heard Peter, Paul, and Mary doing For Love and Me. I said, my goodness, I said, I guess I, on the radio, you know, they're recording of, of For Loving Me. Uh, I said, maybe I have arrived, I don't know. But I, but I never took anything for uh for granted, and I, and I kept writing, and I always kept the the hopper filled, you know, always ready to prepare to get in and do another album. And when I finally got with the big company, Warner Brothers, I mean, golly, we we did like 14 albums there, and uh, uh, that was a lot of work. I, I I actually did my whole contract there, and uh, we went up there doing only five for uh, United Artists. Before that, I was to do six, but we got out after five. So that I could sign with Warner Brothers, and, uh, and uh, now I, I, uh, I, I'm clear of them. I actually uh, I did one independently while well, I was recovering from a health issue that I had back in 2002, and we, we put that one out independently. On uh, we came out in True North. So, before we wrap this up, again, uh, this documentary has a lot of honesty, not just about your music about your life, your relationships, and things like that. Do you realize now what impact that you've had on music, on the Canadian fabric, and just for music lovers in general who love listening to your songs? It, it, was, uh, it, it was North American. It was. We, we, we went over big in the States, and we, big in both places. Uh, we went over big in Canada first, and uh, then we got a, a hit record in the States. And Once we had the hit record there, uh, things opened up very quickly down there. I was getting into singing in concert. No, uh, then all of a sudden we had su the record Sundown, the, the follow-up. Meantime, we were competing with the Beatles throughout all of this, too. And uh, we we managed, you know, to get a, get a couple out there. The record, the Edmund Fitzgerald, kind of came along later. We it was not meant to be a a, a bestseller, but it it was. It was written as a folk song for an album, and it be, became a, a popular song. So you know, and it, and very quickly, it almost sounds like you're almost saying that a lot of things, as much as you wanted it, happened by accident. Yes, uh, that's what I, I think about that when I think about the Fitzgerald. I've, I've thought that many times in my mind. It was a, a accidentally, it accidentally had a hit over something, that, over an accident that occurred. And uh, the 29 men who still sleep at the bottom of Lake Superior as we sit here right now. They never found anybody. They never found anybody. If you could give any advice to today's generation for songwriting, what would it be? Uh, okay. Uh, you, you build, build up a... Uh, uh, get, get more than just the one. Get, get, get a few. See if, see if you can write a, write a few. Don't stop at one. If you write one... See if you can write a few more and make them all different. A different key, different tempo, but all different. You only have five keys 
of the guitar that really are, are suitable for folk music. And, uh, get get more, more than one, and, and all different. If you can do that, you've proven something to yourself right there, because making them all different is part of what it's, <laughs> what it's all about, because if you didn't do that, they'd all sound, sound the same. Been able to do that over the years, my friend. Look, I'm going to let you go. I'm looking forward to seeing the documentary as we speak. They're going to be showing at the Tiff Bell Lightbox. I'm going to be there in the audience. There'll be a Q&A going on with you too. Looking forward to this. Um, but more importantly, thank you so much for all the interviews over the years, my friend. I know my cat too. Remember my cat? I do. <laughs> passed away. I cried my head off oh my when the when the, the the cat Jomo. I remember that. I remember the cat the last time I was here, because he just kept popping out somewhere. We got him on film. <laughs> the cat on film. My friend, thank you so much. Okay.